when most people come home from work, they go, honey, you can't believe what happened at work today. And it's really, but when we come home from work, we're dealing with celebrities or we're dealing with major people or we're dealing with major incidents. Tell me the story that, you, that you've dined out on all these years. <laughs> oh, I was in a cornfield in a radio station in Dubuque, Iowa, recording with James Earl Jones. He didn't like the scripts and he wanted to walk after I had promised Ted I was going to get James to record stuff. <laughs> and I had to talk him down and actually get it, get everything, you know, and I got everything done. Wait, 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 wait. Before you move on from that, you just gave me the Reader's Digest version. I need to know and the viewers need to know how you got him to do it. <clears throat> hey, it's David Levin, and welcome back to another Pop Goes to Culture. As I had mentioned previously on this channel, uh, we're doing a little bit of a pivot. I'm still going to be running my celebrity interviews from the vault, but we're also going to be taking a look at people's career, people who have worked in the TV and film industry. And today we've got a good one. Uh, as a like, like, like Al Franken would say, for a change. Uh, this guy's a near 40-year veteran of first broadcast, then cable TV. He got his start in on-air promotion at NBC. Yes, that was a network back in the day. And then followed the emergence of cable to Bravo and the Playboy Channel as a senior writer-producer. From there, he went on to handle all sports promotion for USA. He served as vice president of on-air promotion and video marketing for all the Turner Broadcasting Networks. We'll explain who Turner was later. Uh, sports teams and subsidiary companies. And recently ended his semi-illustrious career. Semi-illustrious, That's those are his words. It was an illustrious career. It has been at the helm of his own boutique TV networking marketing company. Say hi to Jeff, the Count. Grimshaw. Hey, Jeff, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Hope you're doing well, David. I am doing really well. You know, you have had quite a career. In some ways, I feel like I was always about a step or two behind you because I think whenever you left the company, I came and showed up five minutes later because I would hear your name and, oh, do you know Jeff Grimshaw? No. And I didn't end up here <laughs> meeting you face to face until decades later, but it was like, you left Bravo, they needed to fill a space, there I was. You left USA, they needed to fill a space, there I was. So uh, so in many ways, I'm, I've been following in your footsteps, but you have had quite the career, and you, like me, you started at a time when broadcast was king. Tell me about that. Well, I fresh out of NYU in, in 1979 with a, uh, a BA and television tucked into my under my arm at, you know, from the school of film and television there. I, I thought I had, uh, you know, the world uh, was my oyster. And you know what? The broadcast was king and there was very limited opportunity in broadcast. And there was this thing out there called called cable, which everyone was kind of laughing at. But, you know, we, everyone wanted to be in broadcast. And I, I actually wore out a, a pair of wingtips uh, in New York, cruising, you know, Sixth Avenue and looking for a gig. And I, I got an internship at, at NBC and it turned into a job for a few months. And then the show I was on was canceled. And I managed to sign on with WPIX Channel 11 in New York, 11 Alive. Right. And, and uh, did that for and then got a, an offer from Paramount Pictures with um, the the black sheep of the Douglas family, Joel Douglas, to work on a motion picture and be, kind of be his assistant. And I did that, and I found out real fast I didn't want to be in motion pictures. It's a rough, rough business. It takes you away from home for you know months and months and months at a time. And I was engaged to a beautiful woman who's still my wife. And I came back to television, and there was this little ad in, in uh, uh, what was it, Backstage Magazine for a writer-producer uh, for uh, a group called Rainbow that owned Sports Channel, Bravo, and and at, at that point was Escapade, then turned into the Playboy Channel. And uh, we, I worked for a terrific guy. Uh, I got the job, worked for a terrific guy named Todd Berman. And um, I was first assigned to Bravo and then uh, and then to Playboy and, and also doing some work for Sports Channel. I was a triple threat. Um, so... Uh, there was that. And then, you know, you kind of hit the wall at, the, at that place. And I went to USA and I hit the wall two years later at that place as they divested themselves from sports. 
they were huge into sports and then found out it was really expensive and they didn't want to foot the bill for that and sent some of those sports down to Turner Broadcasting. I, I sent my resume down to there. We were on the, I think the 23rd floor of Simon and Schuster building, David, I, I was it 23rd? Yes. Yes. And, yes that's yeah, exactly right. I, I, and they had that like mail shoot and, and I put the letter down there and before it hit bottom, my phone rang. It was, it was, uh, Pammy Pearson who was running on air promotion. She said, I, I need someone to run sports promotion. And, and I think you're the guy. And I, I said, okay, I can be down there in a couple of weeks. And she said, no, I want you down here. This was on Thursday. I want you down here in two weeks, two days. I want, we're desperate. And I oh came back basically with a job <laughs> and I had to break the news to my wife that we're moving to Atlanta from New York and she's still never forgiven me. <laughs> that, so the interesting thing, Jeff, is that, that we both sort of early parts of our career were in on-air promotion, which is, seems to be a dying art these days. People, you know, I mean, because there's no real need for it. Everybody's streaming. And so the promotion that they're seeing is on their screen. But I, I kind of call the 1980s the, the, the golden days of on-air promotion. But a lot of people who are watching now have no idea what on-air promotion is or was. Can you, can you explain it in 25 words or less? I can. We are responsible for making you, you the viewer, watch more TV than you really should by, by putting out commercials that say how great – upcoming programs are when in fact they really kind of suck. Wow. You did, you did do that in the, in tw now there was a culture of on-air promos back then. Uh, in fact, and I would say, I would venture to say that Nickelodeon sort of uh, spearheaded a certain level of creativity in on-air promos because the shows that they were running were shows that even Local syndication didn't want to run anymore, so they were the ones who took old shows that were that were old when we were kids, you know, the the, the I guess uh, Mr. Ed and and stuff like that, and put them into a context of fun. You weren't tuning in so much for the for the shows as you were for the for the promos and the things that surrounded the shows. Nickelodeon was they were they were outstanding at taking what was old and making it new. And you know, I don't I'm not sure we consciously benchmarked by the way, the guy over my shoulder, that's the guy who broke into the business in 1979. I wish I were <laughs> I wish you were, I don't wish I were he again because I would I wouldn't want to go through all that heartbreak of oh, I think I'm going to get the job. I didn't get the job. Uh, yeah. but Nickelodeon was great. At Turner we 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 tried to do that too. Uh, with WTBS Superstation and making right. old fun, but Nickelodeon, I, I think they were the kings of that. And 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 there were people like Jay Newell. Oh, who are some of the other people over there? I, was Lee Hunt involved? I think Lee Hunt may have I been. Think involved. You, I think at some point he was. Some of those just... real lions of the of the early of the early days who went who were I think some are you know Lee is still a lion of the industry of the of the dying industry of on air promotion. I just tried to look up. We had a. We had a, a, a trade group called Promax. First, it was BPME. Yep. I don't think they exist anymore. Oh, because I, nothing, I can't find nobody them. does that stuff. I, yeah. I know. But I still see promos. I, I still see I still see commercials that say, uh, on-air promos that say, like, don't miss. And it's like, I'm saying, huh? Who the, what infant, incompetent is writing that? What do you mean, don't miss? You can see anything. You never miss anything. That's right. You have to, That's you right. Have to don't, willfully miss something. Don't touch that dial is not yeah, something that people that say dial. anymore. But the other part of that is you can watch anything you want whenever you want. I mean, the thing, and we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. The, the other part was there was real competition. I mean, when the broadcast networks were running, they, they had little competition. I mean, it was like two other networks and then a couple of local stations. Once you got into cable, now you're starting to compete with other networks that are running a lot of reruns. So you're really not competing with anything major. But the on-air promos, I think, were a way to hopefully make what you're what you were showing stand out from the crowd to make you go oh i really need to see that and, and we were we we had broadcast in our sites you know when i when i first 
got to Turner, I think it was 70% of the viewing was all broadcast and 30% was cable. Uh And I remember when we made, we got 50, 50, we get weekly reports. We had a great research department. Hello, Bob Sieber. I hope you're out there. Um, <laughs> and, and they would give us all the information we need. And we worked in lockstep with them. A lot of a lot of these groups, programming and promotion and research didn't work together. At Turner, we really did. And I think that was one of our real strengths is that we, we, we all had the same mandate. We all wanted to see success. We all wanted as, as much consumption as is humanly possible. And we all worked, you know, in lockstep. In, in getting there. And I remember when we, we, we overcame over the 50% barrier and that, and that the actual tables tipped in the direction of cable and broadcast, they, they didn't, they never, they never reacted. They never fought back. We would make fun of broadcast because, and David, uh, you know, cable, we, we were very, we were very um, uh, cognizant of getting the address out there at, at the top and at the back end of the spot, Todd Berman at, you know, at, at Rainbow taught me that, and I and those lessons were well learned. You know, broadcast would say, you know, Fantasy Island for, uh, Saturday, and we and and I'd say that's like you know you build up what's going to happen in the show on in these promos, and then I said that's like, and then you give them this this you know two this two second where where you can find it in this cluttered universe, and I'd say you know that's like saying. Um, there, there's this great party. There's going to be sex, rug, drugs, and rock and roll, and models, and everything. And someone says, "Well, where is it?" You go here. Okay, find it. You know, <laughs> you know. It's 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 and 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 broadcast never responded. They still forty years, forty five years later, they still haven't responded, and they're scratching their heads, wondering why they only have I don't know twenty percent of all viewing now. You said and something now, funny. Yeah. yeah, you said something funny before we uh, before we uh, started, which was that broadcast used to laugh at cable, and then cable laughed at broadcast, and now streaming is laughing at cable. Streaming is laughing at everyone, and 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 yet you would think, you know, we we you, you're talking in 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 your kind of mandate, you want to help people, you know, get into this business. And it's it's as tough as as when we did. It's it's even tougher because the landscape is so unknown. And and two, you think that everything's going to open up with all these streamers coming on board? No, they're just rounding up the usual suspects. They're the programmers and the support people. They're just the usual suspects. So it's yeah, it's that much harder because you have cable dying over here, broadcast, mm-hmm. and it's I'm going to say it's death throws. And, and now you've got streaming here, but they're just sucking all those people away. And the newbies, I, I would hate to be looking for work now. I can't imagine how difficult it would be. A lot of people are, and a lot of people are losing their jobs. I mean, the networks, I mean, as of this recording, I think Paramount let go thousands of people today is what I heard. Oh. And, and you know, Warner Brothers, Warner Discovery, whatever they're calling it this month, you know all these all these places where you and I have have you know cut our teeth. Um, whoever thought that they would not be profitable enough to to maintain, and that places like Netflix, which didn't exist several years ago, and and YouTube would be the dominant players in 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 today's television marketplace. Were you ever rift, David? Meaning reduction in force? Were you ever riffed out? I was never riffed out because I was always freelance, except when I was under contract. So nobody ever. uh, Funny story. So I was doing um, one one of my clients. I won't mention which one. uh, I was in part time status, and uh, and I was part time for quite some time. And I was doing one session a week, and it was a nice way to sort of begin my cable career to know that I sort of had a one one day a week or three day a week uh, gig where I would go in one day and work at home from home two days a week. And it was it was great because it allowed me the freedom to develop the rest of my freelance career. And then somebody said to me, oh, we're going to be hiring somebody full time. And so your position will be going away. And I said, oh, well, OK, it was nice while it lasted. And then they hired someone and someone left. So, David, we need you for a little while longer until we replace that person. I go, okay. I worked, uh, they hired someone else and someone left. 
oh, David, we're going to need you a little while. I mean, that lasted like four years. So it was like. You're the, the great American bench player. Yeah. Bench, I was, bench you know, and it, it was, look, it was a good gig. And every place I ever worked, I worked like a freelancer, which means that I always worked like this job will be gone tomorrow, which even when you're full time and even when I was working under contract for somebody full time, I always tried to work as if tomorrow the job could go away. So always put in the maximum amount of creativity, the that, maximum that is, amount that, of thought. Yeah, that's very true, because after Turner, I opened a boutique, you know, network television marketing company. We had a lot of great clients. Mm -hmm. I had one client for 17 years and. And the guy who hired us on, who had left, you know, three years into, he used to come up to me every year. He'd say, you have no business still holding on to that business. I said, I know that. I well understand that it could be our last day. And then one day you get a letter in the mail and they say, we're, we're not doing business with you anymore because we're doing, we're, we're building in-house. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was always, you, you can't take, even if you're freelancing, and again, there's nothing wrong with free, freelancing. Uh, yeah. Yeah, people say you're your own boss. And the answer is no, no you're way. Not. No, Everybody, you're not. Every client you have is your, is your boss. your boss. That's right. Yeah. And you have and you, and you have free reign. Yes, but you have no say. And you can pitch and you can consult. And again, I would consult until the cows came home about mm -hmm. to my clients about how to better. But at the end of the day, it was their call and not mine. So consulting is a great gig, but it's also it's it's frustrating if you if you want to make a difference, you know, it's uh, you're, interesting. It's not in that position. I always had a philosophy when I was consulting or freelancing or whatever else that I will give you my best first take. I will give you my most creative swing for the fences pitch. And then if you want to change that and do something else, I will do what you want to do and execute as well as I can the vision that you ask me to execute. I will never go, oh, you know, you know, because honestly, when it comes to the client, I have no ego. I'm proud of the good work that I do. But if it's not going to work for them, I'm going to say to them, okay, what do you, what do you need? What do you want? And there are a couple of times when I've been disappointed by the direction that they went in but if they're happy i'm ha and they ask you oh, are you happy i'm like are you happy i mean i'll be happy when you're happy and, i can and tell I'm you a story I, i'll tell you a story that, about that when i was i was honored and proud to be part of the launch team of the national geographic channel and my client was, uh, she's no longer living. She died in a tragic accident a couple of, of years ago. And she's a dear, dear woman and a good friend. And 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 so she hired me because I had freelance for her at, at two other companies. And so she was rounding up the usual suspects of people she thought could help her. She was uh, running, you know, the marketing czarina of the of the entire uh, endeavor. And uh, I was asked to to come up with all sorts of positioning statements. And uh, I did, and it was uh, it was it was Dare to Explore, your National Geographic Channel, Dare to Explore. I said it, it plays off the Explorer franchise that's no longer on TBS, and yet was a huge franchise for them, uh, and it was also PBS before that. So we're 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 bringing in a lot into under the tent who already know what you're all about, um, and that they they accepted that, and they but at last. In the last minute, a, a hotshot advertising agent came and uh, uh, agency came and, and get pitched them on uh, National Geographic Channel. Always wonder. And um, <laughs> the Zarina asked me how I felt about it, and I said, "Do you do you want me to do you want me to candy coat it and be a good uh, be a good uh, consultant?" She said, "No, I want to know how you really feel." And I said, "Okay, you're always going to wonder why you pay top dollar for such a crappy positioning statement." And uh, she laughed. She said, I, "I know I don't like it, but the, my boss likes it, and she's the president of the entire network." Oh and I said, well, "Okay." So and so we supported it and took brought it out and 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 worked with it as best we can in as many ways as humanly possible. And two years later, I get a note from her saying, "Hey, we, we're going to be changing branding. We're going to uh, something called uh, Dare to Explore." And. Uh, <laughs> I, I sent her a note. I just said, I said, gee, 
I wish I had come up with that. And a note came back, be quiet and do your work. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the life of a consultant. Yeah, yeah, it sh- it sure is. And it's that I would guess that it's still that way now, except it's harder to get to that place where you are a consultant. I have to imagine, you know, I was talking to somebody recently and they said, you know, for the people at the beginning, they're probably going to do okay. And the people at the end, well, they've done okay. They might not continue to do okay. But the people in the middle, they're they're going to have trouble staying in the business. You and I have watched this business change multiple times. It changed faster now than it ever has before, you know, and everybody says pivot, pivot, pivot. And it's like, you know, we're, we're, we're spinning as fast as we can pivoting on a, on a hourly basis as opposed to pivoting, uh, you know, once every couple of years, once every six months, it's just the pivoting gets faster. But as someone who has who who has been in this business a long time, surviving and thriving is one of the biggest challenges. It's almost like learning how to produce TV is secondary and getting through navigating the changes in the industry is is primary. What 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 kind of advice would you give to someone who's who's you know trying to navigate that that industry? Oh boy! As I said, it, it it appears again. If everyone, if if people in cable land and even in streaming land are 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 going, it's an accordion. It expands and it contracts, and it appears mm-hmm. as though the industry is in a pretty much a, a contraction mode. But they're not going to have all of the. Uh, ways and means and personnel to do everything. So if you can package up your experience base into a consulting or a, a freelance gig, do it. Because when they get ready to hire, they're going to get hired people that they know, and that will be you. My question is, oh, do you, I mean, I, I, this is a this is a huge pivot. Do you really ever want to work for a corporation again? It's not like it was. No. I mean, people were loyal back in our day. Um, you know, uh, back in my day, well, I, uh, I'll tell you, Sonny, get off my lawn. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was only ushered out of one uh, organization only because the number two guy in the company didn't like me. And that oh. was all that was all because of 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 politics. And you get up high in an organization and your head gets above there. It can get whacked mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what happened to me. Uh, I was out of work for about seven minutes. And I was well compensated for 16 months after. And, and, and so I was double dipping. For, so it turned out to be a boon rather than something that was uh, uh, calamitous. Uh, but what I, but what I, what I think if you're going to pivot, you know, I, you, can, you can go and pound the pavement, you know, the digital pavement and, and not get anywhere. But I would look for the areas that are, are expans- either expanding or contracting and throw yourself hat into the ring as a, someone who can, you know, do this, do that, do the other thing based on your experience and your success. I, 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 that's at this point, that's the only advice I can give you because once, you know, I also pivoted te- 10, what's it? 10 years ago to education mm-hmm. and taught, you know, in college internet media for five years. And that was, ex- I didn't have a textbook. And they said, why don't you why don't you want a textbook? We always have to. I said, because a textbook will be out of date in, in three or four months based on what's going on here. You know, remember when Google had a social media uh, 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 solution and then it one day they just pulled the plug on it. And, and, and so that's how fast things change. I'm, I'm going to have to look that up on my space. I can't. Yeah, um, look it up on my space. Uh, so uh, again, I would, you know, like you did, and like I did after my corporate career, you look for opportunities to fill in the gaps. Or if you're a program creator, see how much you know you're using AI to do things that you would have to pay a lot of money to do. Mm-hmm. There are all sorts of new ways and means and and cost cutting measures out there to be a do it yourself guy. And if you know how to promote. 
you know, you may be able to create something that will gain attention of some of the big boys. And then you might find yourself playing with them a little bit. I don't. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I mean, the key is to to sort of look at, at what's going on right now. I mean, people say that, uh, you know, and I've said this before, the, the people who are creating new programs now, especially the ones that cost money, you know, the stuff on Netflix and, and where, where they seem to still be spending money, they're competing not just with the other stuff that's being produced right now, they're competing with everything that's ever been created since TV or film production started. They're competing with stuff that, you know, with the kiss that was made in the 1890s or the great train robbery that was made in 1912 or the stuff that was, you know, people are just finding random stuff on YouTube. They're finding this. They're probably turning it off after about five minutes because who wants to look at two old guys ruminating about the industry. But the, but the fact is, you know, there are great resources. And if you have a phone, you can make programming and you can get experience. We couldn't do that back in the day. But there's no real apprenticeships so that you can learn best practices. Everybody's kind of reinventing their own wheels. Um, but part of the pivot, and I think what you said is makes a lot of sense, is to be able to, to transfer your skills to whatever the next thing is going to be, whether it is AI. And some people are calling AI the, the, the death of all mankind. I don't necessarily see it that way, but you know, your mileage may vary. And so for people like us who are not quite finished, but but you know, at the back end. Uh, you know, we we can still pivot, um, but for people who are used to working in the corporate environment or used to being in a situation in which they get a regular paycheck, that's a big pivot. That's you know, was it was it when you decided that you were going freelance, or when it was decided for you that you were going freelance, uh, was it culture shock? Actually, not because I had decided after I left Turner, I went to another company. I won't mention the name uh, up in the D.C. area. And I didn't really like the company. I didn't really like what I was doing. I was being paid very well for what I was doing. Um, I was receiving offers from other companies to help them launch, help them rebrand, help them redefine themselves, help them doing everyday pieces of business. And I kind of had to stiff arm them and saying, look, I have a staff position. But when I decided I didn't want to be, uh, it was very simple. I got to a point where I didn't want to get out of bed and go to, to my work. So yeah. I, I went to the president of the company. I said, look, I'm going to leave in four months time. And he said, no, you're not. You're too important. I said, no, I'm going to leave, but I'm not going to leave. I will consult back to you at half salary with no no benefits and, and no no t overhead. And uh, I'll be doing the same thing because because I'm sitting I'm sitting on my thumbs half the time. So I will prorate that. And meanwhile, I could tell all these other people in line, hey, I can do that work. now." I walked out of that company with what I had and then a pretty good pad on that and, and with contracts for a couple of years. So there was no decision to be made. It's like, you know, if you don't like what you're doing, I had never I had always adored what I was doing. And when on the day on the day when I looked at my wife, I said, I don't want to I don't want to go. And she said, I know, but you have to. But do something about it if 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 that's the way you feel. That is a very inspiring story and uh, and one one that that I'm glad you told. Uh, we have a few minutes before we wrap up. Uh, first of all, I want to find out. Tell me tell me a story. Tell me. Tell me an anecdote, something you've dined out on all these years. You know, when, when most people come home from work, they go, honey, you can't believe what happened at work today. And it's really, but when we come home from work, you know, we're dealing with celebrities or we're dealing with major, major people or we're dealing with major incidents. Tell me. Tell me the story that you that you've dined out on all these years. <laughs> Here's a couple. Um, hey, how was your day at work, Jeff? Oh, well, I had a chopper shoot in Atlanta today, and a big gust of wind almost blew the chopper into the 40th floor of the Weston Peachtree Center, and I saw God. Okay, that's oh, one. Uh, two, 
oh, how was your day? Oh, I was in a cornfield in a radio station in Dubuque, Iowa, recording with James Earl Jones, and uh, uh, he didn't he he didn't like the scripts and he wanted to walk after I had promised Ted I was going to get James to record stuff, uh, <laughs> and I had to talk him down and actually get it get everything you know and I got everything done. Uh, How did you, wait, wait, wait 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 before you move on from that because you just right. got it done you gave me you just gave me the Reader's Digest version I need to know and the viewers need to know. How you got him to do it? Okay. Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's a secret, but James has a little dyslexia problem. And uh, and we loaded up. I had, these were scripts for the Goodwill games and some were promos and they were very simple scripts and they were easy to do. But we also had a 12 page sales presentation that was written by some guy in Chicago that was all market speak. And James didn't know what he was saying. He couldn't get three words out without stumbling. And he finally decided, and I'm trying to get the Darth Vader sound out of him. And he's sounding like Jeffrey, I forgot his last name, the Uncola man for 7-Up. And I'm and Jeffrey and I'm Holder? Saying, yeah. And I, and I said, no, I, I I need Darth. I need it. And he says, well, you know, that went through the harmonizer. And I said, I, I, I know we're going to do, we're going to give a goose it up a little with that. But I got to have the base there. And he goes, I'm giving you the best I got. And, and, and just time, you know, with talent where you press forward and when you back off, I backed way off. And James put down the scripts and he says, you know, Jeff, I'm not sure this is working out. I don't even know what I'm saying. And so here's what I'd like to do. I'm going to put the scripts down. I'm going to go my way and you go your way. And, 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 and I'll call my agent and, and there'll be no charge. And I said, James, I don't want to end it that way. And plus I promised Ted, I was going to bring you home and, and I can't come back empty handed. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to record these really simple scripts. And I put one in, in I said, can you read that? And were, he says, oh, I can do that. I said, so I'm going to order all the extraneous people out of this room, just the engineer and you and me, and we're going to do this. And, and we're going to have a cup of coffee and everything's going to be nice. And we recorded the first one and he nailed it. And he said, do you want to do you want a protection? And I said, why not? And he did a second time. And then we did the next one. And then I said, now we got to tackle this bear, the 12th page. And he said, and he said, well, let me see when I want to start. And he turned the first page. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. And he got to page six. He goes, I could start here. And I said, James, let's just do this one phrase at a time. Well, we did it. One phrase at a time. 483 edits in that piece. And James did it. Now, the, 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 the epilogue to that was my phone rang a few days later, and it was James's agent. And she said, you know, Jeff, we, we booked two hours with James, and you went four. So maybe we should double the rate. And I said, ah, 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 ah. You didn't tell me James had a problem with reading scripts cold. And she said, well, no one's supposed to know that. And I said, I'm not out there telling the world. Now I am. But, um, you know, I'll tell you what. I'll give you half again as much. And because there's something coming up that I, I know we want to use James for, and I want to stay on your good side. And that good stuff came up you know, three or four months later with this is CNN. And, you know, that was, that meant that's made history. So when, you know, the Simpsons and family guy and everyone else makes fun of this is CNN, I always smile. That's, I guess that's the only three words that still remain from my reign at Turner. Well, we could have a whole other conversation about what happened <laughs> to CNN, but we'll save that for another day. Yeah, uh, I, got, said, I got opinions. I got opinions on that. Oh, we can go with that. Uh, was there one more that you wanted to tell? Or, or well, the, the last the last one is, and I think it still stands as the highest non NFL rating in the history of cable TV. Was Secrets of the Titanic in 1986? Robert Ballard found the Titanic. National Geographic got the rights to all that, and we had the the world premiere play. And they're talking about it in the program meeting. And this, I get hit thunderstruck with an idea. I said, well, why don't, instead of that, that runs from eight to 10 in, in the evening, and that's going to kill it in prime time. I said, but why don't we run the whole day with Titanic programming? So we, we already had a night to remember. And I said uh, to the programming chief, I said, hey, Jack, why don't we 
call like ABC, who produced about three years ago, SOS Titanic with Linda Pearl and an all-star cast was a miniseries. I think it's about nine hours and we can run that nearly all day long and run it right up to, well, he said, he said, okay. And 20 minutes later, he said, I, I got it. And we called the whole day Titanic Sunday and it still stands as the highest rated day. And that's from 86. And we are now in 24 uh, 14. So that's 38 years later. Am I right? 38 years later as the highest rated, the most consumed day of programming in the history of cable television. I'm pretty proud of that. Congratulations. That is, that's, that's something to be proud of. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for coming on with me today. This was really fun. It's always fun to talk to you and, uh, I hope you can come back and one day maybe we'll, we'll do this live so people can actually, uh, you know, ask you questions. Yeah. <laughs> Who's that guy over there who thinks he knows what he's doing? And, and again, I will admit now to, to anyone who's, you know, in, in transition, I don't know what I'm saying right now. I've been, I'm, you know, I'm 10 years removed from the active industry and five years removed from teaching, but I still keep my eye on stuff. It's changing. It's gosh, it's changing. And you have to change too, David. I, I say, you know, once upon a time we had editors doing all of our editing. Guess when you edit, when you, when you need something edited, uh, who edits it? Yeah. Me. You. That'd yeah. be me. Yeah. yeah. We well, never like, touch the stuff. Who do you think set up? Well, we set up our own cameras today. I guess it's a, it's a really different world. In some ways it's easier for people to get experience, but harder for people to make a living. Uh, the stuff that we used to get paid, you know, the, the edit rooms we used to go for two, three, four hundred dollars an hour. And now you can do it with a three hundred dollar, you know, program on a on a seven hundred dollar computer. Yep. So it's 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 the economics of creating is different. But so is the economics of uh, displaying and showing. And so the key is if somebody wants to make their living in the business of TV, film, you know, whatever, streaming, whatever you want to call it, uh, that's changed. And I'm going to try to follow those changes and help people out if I can. Um, where can people get in touch with you if they want to get in touch with you or if you want them to get in touch with you, in which case I'll cut this whole part out? Uh, no, uh, again, I do a, I do a weekly uh, uh, live show on Facebook called The Sports Nuts with a couple of other nutty guys, and we're all over the country, and we, we talk about what's going on in sports. We're extraordinarily opinionated. Uh, we're, we're, we don't hold back any punches. Uh, one of them is a USA Network uh, uh, alum from way back when in the 80s, and he, he was also a Turner alum in the early 2000s. So all of our, all of our careers, yours included, we all parallel tracked. And, yep. uh, you know, we all, I remember we always used to keep eye, an eye on one another. Oh, did you hear what's going on with this? Oh, did you hear what's going on with this? Guy? So um, it's a, it's a, we're all brethren and uh, I, I cherish all of those days. And I, I hope that people are having those kind of relationships in this, what I call this rotten industry. What I, what I loved about those days was that there was a friendly competition. And I don't mean we were competing with each other. I meant that we would see and enjoy each other's work and we would learn from each other. And then we go, okay, how can I take that to the next level for the fun of it, to make our work better and to say, oh, I just saw what he did. I'm going to, I'm going to try this effect, or I'm going to try that, or, oh, that just gave me a great idea for a spot, or that just gave me a great idea for this, that, or the other thing. And I enjoyed that. And competition is kind of the wrong word, but we sort of spurred each other on to do better. Yeah. We were all keep, we were keeping up with the advertising and promotion Joneses, I guess. I'll tell you a quick, I'll tell you a quick story. And then, cause I'm wrapping up. Uh, years ago, when I was doing promos, I had uh, I had a uh, an interview at an advertising agency, and I came in and I had a five minute demo, and they were like, they're looking at it, and they're like, okay, so what did you do? I said, well, I, I made these spots. Well, but what did you do? Well, I wrote them and produced them and. And, you know, sat in the edit room. But what did you do? I wrote them and 
no, but but what was your part of this? I'm like, I watched the show or the movie and I picked the clips and I wrote a script and I directed the voiceover talent and then we went into an edit room and then we mixed the edit and then the next day it was on the air. So how many years worth of work is this on your demo? Oh, this is what I've done in the last six months. They're like, because every one of them, this guy wrote, this guy produced, this guy went out and shot, this guy went out and did the boards, this one pitched it to the client. And their demos were, you know, they had one spot that they had spent over six months producing. And we were cranking out spots. Well, I mean, I was doing two a week for AMC or Bravo. I was doing two a week for USA. And I was doing two every other week for Lifetime. So I was turning out an average of five spots a week, and that doesn't even count the stuff I was doing for CBS, Fox Video, Warner Brothers, and eventually MTV and Nickelodeon and Nick, Nick at Night. I mean, it was just, you know, the body of work that we, that we produced in any given year was, I think of it now, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> When I was at USA, I was I, I, I was doing some freelancing <laughs> for my old group at Sports Channel. And the guy running running that, he, he, he gave me a set figure for every spot that I could produce. And I, I, I was working from 6P until 6A. I wanted to get I wanted to get 10 spots out in 12 hours. And I got there. <laughs> and after every one, I would be like an adding machine. Ka-ching! <laughs> Ka-ching! <laughs> and we, we, were, we were insane. I almost didn't survive that summer. Oh, my <laughs> I, God. I thought I was going to die that summer. Summer of 84. Oh, my goodness. Well, yeah, the stories go. we could tell. The stories and, we can tell. And the stories we are telling. Anyway, I just want to thank everybody for watching, for sticking with us this long. If you like what you saw, please like it and subscribe. If you want to participate in these conversations and come and ask questions and have us consult and do some live Zooms with me so that I can give you some advice if you need a little bit of advice. Join the channel or join my Patreon um, so that you can be part of it. Uh, we'd love to have you. And when we bring people like Jeff on, you'll be able to talk directly with him. And we'll see you next time with uh, some more of this. In the meantime, we're also showing our... Uh, newly upgraded and up to using AI interviews that from the vault. So uh, here's another one that you might enjoy.